Next up, we have uh, House File 661. Representative Cleburne. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, I would like to make a motion that we move House File 661 to be recommended to be referred to the Committee on Environment and Natural Resource Finance and Policy. You have presenters. <clears throat> I do, Mr. Chair. And up, we have three testifiers today. If I, if, if my motion, if my bill is before the committee, I will start my presentation. Yes, bills before the committee uh, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. I appreciate being with you today to introduce House File 661. Um, this bill appropriates $5 million per year in fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23 from the Clean Water Fund to the Minnesota Department of Agriculture for grants to the University of Minnesota to fund the Forever Green Initiative. I will keep my comments very brief. With me today are experts who will talk about the value of this nationally recognized Forever Green platform and the importance of delivering high efficiency agricultural systems for improved soil and water quality and providing new agricultural environmental and economic opportunities for our farmers, industry, and in fact, all Minnesotans. After we hear from the testifiers, Mr. Chair, we will be happy to answer questions from the committee. And with that, Mr. Chair, I ask that you please recognize Dr. Don Wise of the University of Minnesota. Dr. Wise, please identify yourself for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Yes, I'm uh, uh, Don Wise. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota Department of Agronomy and, uh, and Plant Genetics. So, uh, Chair uh, Sutton, I, I will take just a few minutes uh, to give uh, a little overview and then open it up to uh, other testifiers uh, that will follow if that's appropriate. Thank you. So uh, I know a number of you on the committee are, are well aware of the Forever Green Initiative. It's been a program that's been in place for about 20 years. And over the last number of years, there's been increased investment in the program through the legislative process, through uh, the Clean Water Legacy uh, funds over the last uh, uh, few years. And what I wanted to do is just to give you a brief statement about what the Forever Green Initiative is all about. It's really designed to continue to develop new crops for the state of Minnesota with a primary focus on winter annuals and, and perennial crops. And Jake just, Jungers just gave you a good overview of one of those, right? In terms of, of Kernza, that is one of the primary uh, new crops is being released and going uh, uh, through commercialization uh, today. I've been asked by a couple of the committee members to talk a little bit about the process, the $5,000 per year. How, how do we use those, those funds? Uh, you've all received this document. Uh, this basically is the most up-to-date information and it provides the 16 platforms uh, that describe the crops that are currently under development. When these resources move through the Department of Agriculture to the Dean's office, a call for proposals is sent out to the faculty associated with these 16 platforms. The faculty then develop proposals that are reviewed by a, a uh, review committee. Recommendations are then to, made to the Dean. The Dean then decides on what uh, projects are, 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 are funded, right? And one thing I want to just bring up right up front, the funding that comes from the state of Minnesota through Clean Water Legacy, we've been very, very successful. We've been able to increase those fundings by five to 10 X, right? In other words, $10,000 or $10 million becomes 50 million, right? So we now have the 16 teams. We have a group of 55 people working across this set of new crop development platforms. We are bringing in substantial amount of money based on the state investment from federal funds, foundation funds, 
that are then in place to continue to move this, this, uh, this program forward. Let me just highlight two outcomes. Uh, Jake gave up my story earlier <laughs> that uh, we have now just released the first variety of, of Kernza. It's Minnesota Clearwater. It's named after the lakes and streams. We hope as we release more of these uh, Kerns varieties, we'll continue to name them after the lakes and streams with the idea that these crops protect the water quality and enhance uh, soil health across the, uh, the state of Minnesota. I'll give you one other example. Uh, based on this funding and other funding from other sources, we've been able to domesticate pennycress as a new oilseed crop and protein crop for the cropping systems in the state of Minnesota. A, a winter annual that would fit between the corn and soybean system to fill the brown in the fall. A new type of cover crop that would add economic value to the farmer as well as producing those ecosystem services. All right. So that will be rolled out in new varieties within the next um, uh, three uh, to, to, to five years. So the exciting part is that we have a series of these crops that, are, that have been developed to the point where they're now being rolled out uh, commercially, being produced in the state of Minnesota. And what I would like to highlight is, this is a program that's attracting national and international recognition. Companies from all over the world, across the country are coming to us and wanting to participate in the development of these, of these, uh, of these new crops. So this is, you know, uh, Cargill, General Mills, Kellogg, but not only the nationals, but the local companies as, uh, as, as well. I mean, the smaller. Birchwood Cafe using the grain uh, in, their, uh, in, their, in their food products. Uh, Lake Winds Food Co-op. You saw this already, but it's commercial. <laughs> you can purchase crackers. The idea is that these are turning into, into real, real products. The development of just new crops is a dead end. So within the Forever Green initiative, this is what we do on these platforms. We're organized from basic genomics, breeding, agronomics, food science, and commercialization. That's what's unique about our program and the support that you provide helps keep those platforms in place that allows us to bring additional resources into, into the state of Minnesota. Great, thank you so much uh, for your testimony. We have uh, about two minutes left for the next uh, two presenters. Uh, with our election certificates, we are also licensed to uh, butcher names. Uh, Ann Schwagerl with Prairie Point Farm. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Ann Schwagel. I am here representing the Forever Green Initiative to testify in support of House File 661. I farm in Western Minnesota and I'll try to go real quick. Uh, I farm in Western Minnesota in Big Stone County. I'm a grain and livestock producer operating 400 acres of corn, beans, small grains, and as of 2020, Kernza. I'd been watching the development of Kernza closely along with several of the other Forever Green Initiative crops over the past several years. My husband who farms alongside of me and I are routinely on the lookout for innovative practices to implement on our operation, including incorporating cover crops for cash purposes, reducing our tillage and planting alternative crops to spread out our rotation. In the last few years of trade wars, climate insanity and market volatility, if there are any a uh, lesson, farmers need economically viable third and fourth crop rotations to continue to manage risk on our operations. Following the release of MN Clearwater and the development of the market around the use of Kernza, I finally pulled the trigger and planted my first 40 acre field this past summer. We are eager to harvest it this upcoming July. Starting last June and continuing through the harvest season, I was able to participate in grower calls facilitated by the Forever Green Initiative educating new and experienced growers on best practices for managing the crop from planting through harvest. Kernza is not a plug and play crop. There has been a learning curve to managing this crop and the staff and the researchers, including Dr. Youngers at the University of Minnesota has been with us as farmers every step of the way to ensure our success. I will, I will uh, echo his comments on that one. Kernza with its incredibly deep perennial root system also gives us another tool to continue to improve the soils on our farm. 
increasing our organic matter, as well as increasing our water infiltration rates for the continuing large rain events that seem to come annually now. Kernza is just one choice in the suite of Forever Green Initiative crops that I am continuing to watch though for implementation on my farm. As the genetics, agronomics, and market development can continue to progress, I've been looking at incorporating camelina, winter barley, or pennycrest to make my farm an even stronger tool for stewardship, resiliency, water quality, and enhancing the economic activity in my rural community. In order for these crops to actually be viable on farms though, it requires investment. As a farmer, I appreciate the support shown by the state through the legislative process for the Forever Green Initiative in the past and ask for continued robust funding into the future. Thank you and I'll wait till the end for uh, any questions you might have. Thank you very much. I think uh, questions will, will have to be submitted uh, in writing. Uh, we're up against the clock here. Uh, next up we have uh, Dr. Nicole Atchison. Thank you, Chair Sandine. I'm Nicole Atchison. I'm the CEO of Purist Holdings. It's a family-owned company, a family-owned food and egg company located here in Minneapolis. And I'm testifying in support of the bill specifically to address the Forever Green Initiative uh, focus on the market development. So as a food and egg company today, working with brands in the space, the, we see every day how consumer packaged goods are looking for new marketing claims to really grow on shelf and to meet the consumer purchasing habits. They're looking for crops and ingredients that can check the box on sustainable agriculture, soil health, water health, and traceability. And so today we've heard testimonies from my uh, colleagues here on this bill, as well as multiple before talking about the initiatives on the agriculture side. But it's really important that we go beyond just growing the crops in the field and how do we scale a supply chain that can take those crops and get them to the ultimate brand manufacturers. My family company, Puris, is doing this in peas today. So yellow field peas, which are not a crop that we talk about a lot in Minnesota, but is a crop that's gaining mo momentum. And 20 years ago, when we started, the crops were much like the crops that the Forever Green Institute is talking about. Something that was very niche and no one understood how to use in food. Today, you know, this year we're commercial or we're commissioning a plant in Dawson, Minnesota, about two hours west of Minneapolis, that's bringing 90 jobs to the rural community and will be one of the largest pea protein manufacturing plants globally and definitely in North America. We have a manufacturing plant today that runs in Turtle Lake, Wisconsin, another rural community. And I use this as, as an example to what the future can be with these crops if the commercialization efforts are done the, the way they can, because the market tailwinds are are looking for these sorts of solutions and for US farmers who are growing them and can really carry that value proposition onto the, onto the shelf. But we all recognize that just growing the crop isn't success. Success is when we can grow the crop and market the crop. And the investment of the Forever Green Initiative into developing these supply chains is equally as important, if not more so than the success in the field because success in the field does not equal success. And so I just want to reiterate my support of the full suite of solutions that the Forever Green Initiative is doing because it is truly addressing a market need both for growers, for the planet, as well as for consumers. Thank you. Thank you so much for being concise. Uh, Representative Miller, if you can do this in one minute and get a one minute answer, I think we're on board. I can, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm supportive of the Forever Green program. Uh, I've actually known about it since before I was in the legislature. I met. Dr. Weiss at a presentation in Wilmer. It's a good program, but here's the key to it. It needs to make economic sense for the producers. And that's what we need to do. And that's what we always need to be focused on. I know that there was a bill uh, earlier in session that if you will, kind of, I, I wouldn't quite go as far as saying it was a mandate, but it starts pressuring beyond that economic sense. If we keep focus on that, this is a good thing that you're also going to get the producers out there fully supportive of, as you saw, heard from the one producer in Big Stone County. I have other people in my district that are doing the same thing. They wanna do this, but it has to make economic sense. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your comments, Representative Miller. Uh, next up, we have uh, House File 1680, Chair Marquardt, uh, regarding Northern Crops Institute grant Chair funding. Sundin. Excuse me, Chair, Chair Sundin. Sundin. I'm sorry. We're gonna vote on that bill. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Representative has a motion. Thank you. Oh, okay, that, that was a motion, I'm sorry. Uh, 
Let me get this back. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Sandine, Chair Chair Sandeen, I'll just close by saying thank you to the committee. And I will renew my motion for House File 661 to be recommended uh, to be referred to the Committee on Environment and Natural Resource Finance and Policy. If you haven't signed on to the bill, committee members, I would love you to join me in this work. Okay, uh, you've uh, heard the motion. Uh, Mr. Smith, please take the vote. Chair Sundin? Aye. Sundin votes aye. Vice Chair Vang? Aye. Vang, aye. Anderson? Oh, you're muted. Representative Anderson, you're on mute. I'm gonna pass. I'm not quite sure why this is, isn't being held over for inclusion. Uh, didn't get a chance to ask that question. Um, I don't think we've had enough discussion on this. So yeah, it's a good program. I'd like to know what their funding level has been in the past, but if it's gonna move on, I'm gonna pass. Okay, Anderson pass. Uh, Representative Burkle? I'll pass as well. Burkle pass. Representative Eklund? Yes. Eklund, aye. Hanson R. Hanson R. I. Hanson R. I. Hanson J. Hanson J. I. Hanson J. I. Cleavorn. Cleavorn I. Cleavorn I. Lippert. Lippert I. Lippert I. Lewick. I'll pass. Maybe we'll have a chance to ask questions on the next committee. All right. Lewick, pass. Uh, Miller. Miller I. Miller I. Nelson. Pass. Nelson, pass. Thompson. Thompson. Thompson, I. Thompson, I. All right, that's nine eyes and uh, four abstentions, Mr. Chair. Yeah, that was, did you say nine and four? The motion fails and the bill will move on to the next committee. Thank you, Representative Cleveland and presenters.